Hi, everybody, and welcome to our research series on sensory health. My name is Dr. Cavalier, and I'm joined um, with my colleague, Dr. Uh, almost Dr. John DeMaio. Um, and we're here with three research students who have worked really hard on, um, on a narrative review on the relationship between trauma and sensory processing. Those students are Melanie Johnson, Jacqueline Pendergrast, and Moshmi Shitri. Shitri? I hope I'm saying that correctly. Shitri, Shitri. Shitri, okay. Um, so we're going to get started sort of um, asking you first off, if somebody can just briefly describe your study. Sure, so our study um, really just focused on the impact that sensory processing had on trauma. Okay, great, and can you tell us about your methodology? How did you, how did you study this? So first, um, regarding search terms, we, would, we started pretty broad. Um, we started with sensory processing and trauma, but we really wanted to hone in on um, different types of trauma. So we included terms such as um, sexual abuse, childhood, ad adverse childhood experiences, emotional neglect. And then we also took into consideration the different types of um, aspects of sensory processing. So sensory regulation, modulation, and then we further um, pinpointed that into sensory sensitivity and sensory shutdown, which um, helped narrow down our searches a lot. During your searches, Melanie, were you looking for um, articles that were, um, that had to do with sensory processing and trauma? Was, it, was that connector in there or were you looking for articles um, on either or? Um, we were mostly looking for articles that had both which was a challenge because this was not really something that we felt had a lot of information on. So at times we did have to connect the dots, but for the most part, we did really search for articles that had sensory processing and trauma together. So regarding your search, would you say it was an easy process um, or was it a little more challenging? And if it was challenging, can you kind of describe why? I, I think you just sort of alluded to that, but can you get into a little bit more on that? Sure. Um, it was definitely, it was challenging in the beginning. Um, again, regarding the search terms, it was hard because we felt that a lot of articles mentioned like physical trauma, such as TBI or um, things that we know already alter sensory processing uh, within someone. So that was definitely one of the main challenges we felt that hindered our searches at times, but also um, honing in on a, an age range was also difficult for us because we we found a lot of studies that had to do with childhood trauma and there was it was hard to gather studies that had to do with lifelong um, traumatic experiences. So that was probably um, our two main uh, challenges during searching. Thanks, Melanie. So you did this search on trauma and with varying terms and sensory processing using varying terms, sensory regulation, sensory modulation. What did you find? So our main findings really just demonstrate that trauma causes a neurobiological alteration in the limbic system of the brain. And this can lead to um, sensory processing difficulties, specifically hypersensitivity, and in some cases, numbing or shutdown. So uh, Porgy's polyvagal theory really helped us to connect the physiological, which refers to the sensory processing aspect of it, and the psychological, which is the trauma. Um, and going even further into that, we found that sensory responses to trauma are determined by an individual's active or passive regulatory strategy. So someone who has more active strategies, including a strong support system or better coping um, techniques will have a more functional response to trauma and will recover more quickly. Going off of that, we found 
a key study who uh, done by Angle and Yeager. They looked at two. They looked at a control group and then a study group of people who had experienced post-traumatic symptoms, and they kind of just looked at you know their sensory modalities and how they behaved in everyday life and compared the two. And what they found was people who experience trauma and go on to develop post-traumatic symptoms, um, it all depends on how on their coping resources and their social support, but it influences their sensory processing abilities. So they found that they both, both groups fluctuated between a sense of being numb when um, getting sensation input, and then they also avoided. So that goes into the active and passive strategies of active, you know, they control the situation and they, they control how much sensation they're getting, whereas passive, they kind of let it happen and then respond to it in their own way. So if I'm understanding you uh, correctly, depending on their active or their passive strategies, they respond to, they, a person may possibly respond to trauma differently. And what you're seeing is those who have a passive response strategy will respond in either one of two ways, shutdown or hyper-responsivity, correct? That's, that's very correct. interesting. And that's something that I haven't, um, you know, because I do read this literature regularly, that is not something that I've heard before um, or I've heard put together in that way. Um, so I think that's very interesting. So what does this mean for occupational therapists in your, in your perspective of, of these findings? So we believe that OTs can use this information in terms of tiered interventions. So for example, we believe that it's very important for us to provide education to the general public regarding what sensory processing is, what trauma is, how um, trauma can present itself, and how one can really apply uh, active strategies in order to live a more functional and happy life. Um, for individuals who are at risk, we can lead um, social support groups so they can develop better social networks, um, better coping strategies. And lastly, for people who have already experienced trauma, we can employ uh, trauma-informed care to help them alleviate their symptoms and hopefully recover. I think a big one too is knowing that there is a link between trauma and sensory processing and how like interventions for when working with people who have experienced trauma, how important it is to provide sensory interventions and kind of emphasize even interoceptive awareness where they can understand and recognize the internal sensory information that they have and how to you know, regulate it so that they can fulfill their roles or participate in just everyday life. And where do you think research is now missing in terms of this work you've done? Where's the gap in the literature? Um, so we've given some thought into where maybe future research may go. Um, we thought that the way a person copes, either their active or their passive strategies, how does that impact the way they perceive stimuli? Not only how they handle it or how do they perceive it themselves. Um, we also look, wanted to look into um, going in even into going into uh, what Jacqueline said, I'm sorry, for interception, um, the impact of how attuned they are with themselves. How does that impact how they perceive even not only sensory stimuli, but also a traumatic experience? How, how can they decipher what they are feeling and what their emotions are? Um, we thought those are interesting topics to go into for future research. I think they're very interesting. And I think, um, you know, um, there's a lot of different directions as you, especially in terms of those, you know, tiered interventions that we talked about. And also the potential to use this information to help a lot of people, which is really the most important part. Um, so what did you guys think of the research pro process? How did you feel about this process of doing this really this year long study in depth narrative review of 
the relationship between sensory processing um, and trauma. Um, and can you just share your experiences for any maybe students out there um, who are watching this or possibly any clinicians who are interested in doing, um, you know, a review of the literature to inform their practice? So for me, I felt like um, the process as a whole was very difficult because it wasn't something that we'd ever done before. Um, but what I learned was that there's always another avenue to explore. So if you feel stuck, maybe, you know, change your search term or change something else about what you're doing um, to find the information that you need to find, because normally, usually it's out there. It's out there to find. That's great advice. Right. I have to agree that this is something we haven't done before. So it was challenging, but I think um, knowing how to communicate with your partners, even if it's in a research project or anything that you do as a group, communication is very much a key element into, uh, you know, being on the same page with uh, Moshimi and Jacqueline. Luckily, we're all friends and we're close outside of school too, so it was easy to communicate, but um, that's a key thing that I learned um, that I'll, I'll take with me and to you know communicate. Great. Um, yeah, going off of that, I was going to say it was so important to have such a strong relationship. I mean, when we were in the research class, like last trimester, we talked probably every single day. And personally, I remember being a little frustrated, like if we thought we were on to something and then we were like, wait, no, like we've been doing this for literally over a year. So at first it was done sensory processing and it's that stuck. But then we found, you know, the polyvagal theory. And it was just like looking back from when we first started, it's kind of, it's funny to just think where we were and where we are now with all the information that we found. It definitely seems like your study required that you actually went out and um, co-created this information by bridging concepts together and that it wasn't just simply out there and laid out for you just simply having to search. It seemed like you really needed to understand the concepts and figure out how they fit together. So it sounds like it was a challenge. Like you really took a lot away from this process. Yeah, we definitely did. And I think with Kathy's guidance um, in regards to finding um, the polyvagal theory and uh, using that, we were really able to kind of put things together. I think that's where everything started coming together. It was an exciting project and congratulations on getting it done and uh, teaching the world about the connection between trauma and sensory processing. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. You did a fantastic job and you are to be applauded. This, these were not um, easy concepts to, like John said, to bridge. Um, and you did it, and you did it well, and you discovered something new. So I think that's really important. Um, if anybody has any questions um, about the study, you can reach out to myself or Professor uh, DeMaio. My email is uh, Catherine, C-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E dot Cavalier at DC dot E-D-U. Or John DeMaio, John, J-O-H-N dot D-A-M-I-A-O at dc.edu. And thank you all for watching. See you next time.